New coronavirus cases are plateauing across the U.S., but as we see falling numbers in some of the hardest hit places like New York and New Jersey, infections and deaths are rising in more than a dozen states. In Georgia, where Vice President Mike Pence will visit later today, cases have spiked. The surge comes one month after the state began to slowly reopen its economy. One prominent public health official says the increase likely indicates the virus is spreading and cannot be solely attributed to a surge in testing. For more on this, we have Dr. Bob Lahita joining us to break this all down for us. So, uh, Dr. Lahita, what do you make of what we're seeing in states like Georgia? Well, I, I would agree with... Um, with your uh, other individual who suggested that the 26 percent rise was, in fact, an increase in infections. We know that we've seen uh, groups of people who do not uh, practice social distancing, and the vast majority of people are not wearing masks. And all you need is a couple of individuals to infect three or four people, and, of course, it explodes in those areas. And we know that in certain counties in Georgia, the infection rate has skyrocketed. So, yes, you can attribute some of this to increased testing, but it's more than likely due to an increase in the infection uh, rate itself. We're seeing that also in other countries as well. Not everybody, not every country has the kind of testing that we have. Some countries test routinely and other countries do not. And the issue has always been the large number of deaths that spike in a country uh, and without COVID-19 testing, which we can presume were the results of COVID-19. And to give you an example, Vlad, if you have a nursing home and you usually have two deaths a month and all of a sudden you have 40 deaths a month and no one in that nursing home has been tested, the deceased I'm talking about, then you've got to say that it's most likely due to COVID-19. And we can't get an autopsy done very, very easily anywhere in the country these days because it's just not the way it is practiced as it was 30 years ago. So this poses a big problem for everybody. I'm really glad that you pointed that out, doctor, because there's sort of all this talk about, uh, you know, the numbers are inflated and, you know, if you die in a nursing home, they're just automatically slapping a COVID-19 uh, label on your death certificate. And I'm glad you sort of um, clarified um, the challenges, um, but also, you know, medical personnel don't sort of make stuff up. Um, right. There's a reason that things are being done the way that they're being done right now. Um, but I want to ask you about something else. Um, so the CDC offered sort of these sweeping recommendations as people kind of look to go back to the office, things that they would like to see happen in the American office. Um, they include regular temperature checks, um, desk guards, even no public transportation. I'm wondering how realistic you think some of these recommendations are, and do you think they will be enough? I think that social distancing is difficult in an office setting. And it's even worse in schools. And, you know, I'm hearing from school teachers every week about the difficulty they see in going back to schools, nursery schools, et cetera. But when we're talking about an office where people are in cubicles, it's probably okay because they can wear a mask and they don't have to come in contact with the guy or lady next to them. But when you're not talking about cubicles and people gather together at the water cooler or the coffee uh, machine, this can be difficult. Everybody has to wear a mask. And we're not saying that the kind of cloth mask protects people uh, like an N95 does, but at least it mitigates, as far as can be seen, the individual who is infected, who is asymptomatic, who can give that infection to other people in the office. So if you've got 40 people working on a floor in an office and everybody's in a mask and two of those people are carrying the virus and can transmit it to the other uh, workers, uh, we're protecting those other workers to some degree by having everyone in a mask, including those who are infected and don't even know it, of which there are quite a number. Dr. Bob, we mentioned also public transportation, uh, steps that are being taken uh, to ensure safety on public transit. But I got to say, as a New Yorker who was born and raised in this city, uh, who has used the subway system for his entire life that I've lived here, um, I'm very reluctant to return to the subway. Uh, I don't 
you know, no matter what uh, they're doing to clean and disinfect it. I mean, can someone, and I know, frankly, that what makes me sad is that our essential workers in the city, um, people uh, who do need to take the subway, are on the subways every day, and they have been, uh, even as cases spiked here in New York City and even as they start to come down. So what can people do to protect themselves if they are taking something like the subway. I, I'm guessing that perhaps taxis or buses are a little a, a, a little less worrisome, but I, I would still be worried if I, had, if I had to take the subway every day. And I worry about my fellow I, citizens who do. Yeah, I agree with you, Vlad. I mean, I, I took the subway for many, many years from hospital to hospital within Manhattan. And I have to tell you, sometimes at rush hour, I was crammed in and I could have I could have dropped dead, but no one would have noticed because I wouldn't have fallen over. That's how crowded it was. And I'm sure that's the way it's going to become again. So, you know, and you're, you're touching the bar above so you don't fall over. You're touching the strap in the subway, and you're breathing on the person next to you. So you can wear your mask. And uh, if I was riding the subway, I'd try to wear an N95 mask, which gives me the maximum protection. And secondly, I would carry Purell or I would use the uh, hand sanitizers that are widely available now. Once I got off the subway, I would be very, very careful because we never know who on that subway is infected. The same goes for buses. And I have to tell you, if you're riding a taxi or you're in an Uber, you've also got to be careful because you don't know who was in that taxi or Uber before you. And so uh, it's also possible that you could be infected uh, by that means. However, we've got recent data to show that uh, cushions like leather cushions, etc., the virus doesn't live very long, maybe only 15, 20 minutes on these kinds of surfaces, especially metal, le leather, and other kinds of smooth surfaces. Plastic seats, as in the subway, same thing. So I would be more concerned about the people next to me riding on the subway than I would about uh, the uh, obtaining the infection from the bar above or on the seat that I'm sitting on. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Lahita. 15, 20 minutes for the virus to live sounds like a pretty long time to me, especially on a crowded subway where in that amount of time, three or four people could touch that spot. Um, but really good advice. It's clear that we are sort of launching into a new normal. and We really don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Doctor, thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thanks, Vlad.